Leeds United made the most of their second chance in the European Cup against Stuttgart. The team, they say, has more foreign reserves than the Bank of England. Leeds won 2-1 in Barcelona in front of a tiny crowd. Their hero was Karl Schutt. He scored the winner less than a minute after coming on as a substitute. And tomorrow's his birthday. That was a really awkward silence, wasn't it, for a minute then? Because, like, Prutz has sat here with no earphones on. We've all got <laughs> earphones on. We can hear jingle, he can't. It just gets a bit awkward after a bit. So, episode 46, and we're on location at uh, Pure Business Park. Is it Gilderson, this neck of woods? Something like that. Yeah, it's not Gilderson, Marley. Marley. Yeah. Gil- yeah, somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, we're on location. As you might have gathered, we seem to be on location quite a bit, and that'll become apparent as to why in the coming weeks. But, yeah, we're joined by uh, none other than former Leeds United player. And would you now class yourself as a full-time broadcaster, Prutz, or...? That, it's quite a grand statement, isn't it, broadcaster? <laughs> I read what they put in front of me on a bit of paper or what's above the, the camera. So, yes, along those lines, yes, I do it as, as full-time as you could class it as full-time, yeah. Happy days. Uh, I'm joined by Raggy. How are we doing? All right. Uh, old Ben's here. Hey, yep. Old Ben's got a slightly different microphone, so if he comes in booming through your ears, I am ever so sorry. <laughs> and Young Ben. Hello. Uh, me and Young Ben are sharing microphones, so if you hear any metallic clinking, it's me moving it around. So yeah, uh, off the back of our uh, interview with Jamie Shackleton last week, uh, a small apologies for the sound quality initially. We had a few technical gremlins due to the fact we had to lift up all our technical gear, take it to Ellen Road, rebuild it, and we had about uh, three and a half seconds to do it all in before we had to start <laughs> recording because he needed to be in bed. So, but no, uh, 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 yeah, uh, a big, a big, massive thanks to everybody who's uh, sort of give us any feedback on that. It was, it was a pleasurable experience, and I'm sure this one will be as well. So we're now up to episode forty six. Can't really wow. believe we've got that far. If I'm we're honest. nearly up for a year. I know, yeah, getting there, aren't we? But anyway, so I think best place to start perhaps, is with yourself. Okay, and I'm going to take you back to your forty six appearances for Leeds. Sorry, sixty seven appearances for Leeds, and your four goals. Right. How so, did how awful overall return for goals? <laughs> <laughs> overall, how was your time at Leeds? It was amazing. It was um, something. It's it's bizarre really because it's the gift that keeps on giving. As as I've kind of gone on to do other stuff, um, it's always a topic of conversation. It's always good to keep an eye on where they are, what they're doing, how they're doing it, who's who's in charge of them doing it, um, and it's the more maybe it's rose tinted uh, spectacles, but there's a uh, the more you look back on it as you get a little bit older, the more you appreciate it even more. And it was it was good fun, it was good laugh. That I've played with lads there and, and formed friendships that well, as much as football friendships last have, have lasted a little bit longer. And um it was just great. I mean, I still live I'm I live in up up in Harrogate, so you can't really get away from it. Saying that, I mean you meet Leeds fans all over the place, all over the country, which is all over the world. Exactly. Well, it's just a fair reflection on how much of a uh, beloved club it is. But it, it's it's a proper big old fashioned tradition that everyone kind of knows and loves. You either grow to love it by being very fortunate enough to fart around in the shirt for a few seasons, or you um, or you, or it's there from birth, and I mean you've got no other choice through thick and thin. And at the moment, it's pretty rosy viewing, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and we'll get into a little bit of that a bit later. There's like it? sort of two groups, and there's like people who've. In- Got have had an involvement with Leeds and they love Leeds, or people who aren't and they just hate them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might mention some of them a bit later on. Because for, for the last for the last four maybe five weeks, however long the Spygate saga, which we're going to have to touch on in this episode, so I apologise for our regular listeners, um, has been running on. We've definitely seen the contrasting views on, and I, sometimes you listen to some people and you think you're just blinded by your pure hatred for Leeds mm. United. It's not even a measured conversation. It's just purely that you dislike Leeds. Well, do I think there's been a, it almost kind of presses like a reset button because there was one point I felt in the season where I thought, there's a lot of people liking what Leeds are doing and the way that they're doing it. And then, so then he, like, the manager like probably... too nice. Yeah, like, almost people are thinking, like, waking up in the morning going, what's the odd feeling? Oh, <laughs> I like Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kind of gone... Oh, well, this has happened as well. So they've been doing that, so it's fine. So yeah. that odd feeling I've got has gone, and, and the neutrals probably back more like that. But I think that's all right. But it's it's either absolute adoration. There's nobody's kind of ambivalent about Leeds, are they? They no. go mm, Leeds are all right. They go oh, God, horrible. They go yes, I love them to bit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a funny one. Like I've got a nine year old son, so obviously he's got friends who you know transcend many football clubs. And whenever I'm with them, I always get. Yeah, we all hate Leeds scum. And I think, <laughs> right, you're nine. Where have you got that from? And so I always said to him, why, why, yeah. why, why do you hate Leeds scum? And normally they'll go, um, 
Because my dad or my Uncle John said I've got to, <laughs> and it's that kind of thing. And yeah, it is, it is a funny Because in their funny lifespan, it, they've probably seen Leeds come from League One yeah, yeah. <laughs> into the Championship. Oh, plucky underdogs, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. White little man. It's not oh, quite them, like them, that. them big towners up there exactly, think they're a big yeah. club. They've just come from nowhere. <laughs> look at them. So, yeah. Uh, so, how did you move to Leeds to come about, Prutz? It was, um, I'd come off the back of being on loan at Forest from Southampton, and which was. I'd gone there in the January of, I can't remember what year it was, a long time ago now, um, but Dennis Wise had asked me to come here in the January, uh, and it, I'll be honest, it was it, it looked like Forrest were trying to get promoted out of League One, and it, Leeds were absolutely... Leeds were trying to get promoted to League One. Yeah, I, I, they were hanging, yeah, they were hanging off a grim death, weren't they, really mm. trying to, it was, and it, it didn't look great, and uh, I just, I'd been away, I'd, I'd been down south for about four years, and I planted a bit of kind of... Um, Bit of familiarity by going back to Forest. Mm. Um, I mean, saying that the year before I turned Wisey down, I fell the medical when um, who was in charge then? Uh, Kevin Blackwell was in charge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then it transpired that I went back at a at an operation which I needed, which probably put about tw- two weeks on the end of my career, <laughs> which was great <laughs> as it turned out. And then ended up coming here in the summer. The summer when the most privileged bunch of waste and strays were getting ushered in the door. I mean, there's lads that we trained with for a day, never saw them again. A week, <laughs> never saw them again. And then, like, the ones that kind of stuck it out got to the end of pre-season. Um, and it was good. It was happy camp, all that stuff about um, from the points to not being paid. All the time. It, it was all, we all kind of knew it would be all right. Uh, and Dennis Wise was a great fella to, to work with, and as was Gus. Gus a real, as, as you would see, life and soul of any room and, very um, um, gregarious and outgoing, and he was great. The, the, the pairing of them worked really well, um, for however long that lasted two and a half months, three yeah, months. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Was there not any like kind of concerns? Because there was obviously the club was in mm. turmoil, and there was so much uncertainty whether the club would even exist in, in, in that summer that when there we were, went down. I, I, I mean, didn't we all think that the like the kind of at the pity stomach that they'd be all right? I, I just couldn't see it going completely to the wall. Mm. As much as it, from the, when you hear latterly how bad it was, um, and you look at some bigger clubs that's probably happened to in the, in the interim, or as big clubs that's happened in, in, in the interim, then maybe it was a bit close then was being let let uh, on. But as ever, as footballers, you bury red in the sand, you, you trot out all the usual cliches about it's only matters on the pitch and all that type of stuff. And truth be told, at the time I was a. Uh, I, I lived. Um, I mean, I didn't have any kids, you know what I mean? You, I mean, you kind of, significant others of similar age take care of themselves, don't they? Mm. But when you've got two that you've actually brought into the world, you kind of think, bugger, I've got to look after these. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, maybe there was a sense of fearlessness on our part that it was it was all going to be fine. And it and it was, and it was it was just, it was great. The, the minute you kind of touch down and start, you see it in pre-season or you go abroad and all that type of stuff, it was just great. And, the, and I knew how big it was, having grown up in Hull just down the road. Um, so there, there was no, there was there was no chance I was going to turn Dennis down again because he threatened me the first time for turning him down. So I thought best wise not to do it again. Excuse the pun. Yeah, I mean, for me, them seasons, I, I look back fondly. To be fair, I didn't particularly at the time because mm. unlike you, I didn't share the optimism that we might survive because mm. everything that was coming out was that Leeds United are going to they're going to shut the door and mm. put a note on it saying you're all being made redundant. Sounds familiar. But I was um, going to say, that's, that's very relevant. <laughs> that, no? It was sort of the same as we've had in the last few weeks that oh, we're going to get points deduction and and you sort of you think, well, they, they can't do that, but oh, they might. Because you never know. But yeah, Leeds were, I think if you look back at Leeds were never going to go and disappear. I think, that what from my point of view, I mean, I, I don't know the first thing about running a football club or how much money it costs because it looks like it costs a hell of a lot, doesn't it? Mm. Um, but I always thought there'd be somebody that looked mm. at it and thought that whatever it is, is a viable option because the history going back a couple of generations, but also probably the history that we all grew up with and the, and the players that we came across that very good players yeah. fighting at the top end of the Premier League in Europe, the kind of stuff that big football clubs are made mm. on and attract people that are daft enough to put money into football yeah. clubs. Yeah, yeah, I agree, actually. Look, at how, obviously, it was a, I was a little bit younger then. so I was, A pessimist. Was, yeah, I was a little bit more scared <laughs> of everything in the world. Um but yeah, I, I can remember like 
my first game were like 94 and then transcended through the Champions League year, which was very lucky enough. I talked to my son now and say, oh, I saw Real Madrid at Ellen Road and he see Milan and that, and he looks at me like I'm lying to him, <laughs> which I'm not. Um, and, and then like it all became a bit of a blur. And I, I woke up in Yeovil thinking, <laughs> what's happened? How on earth? How the and it hell? wasn't pre-season. Yeah, how the yeah, hell have we got here? What, like. Yeah, Hughes Park. And, and it's just horrendous and thinking, what what's really happened? But... When I look back at the minus 15 and, you know, all the turbulent times, I also look back quite fondly. Oh, yeah. um, I was lucky enough that I made quite a lot of the games in them couple of seasons because work kind of changed a little bit. And there was a real feeling like we're starting to see now or we have seen the season of us against the world type mentality. Mm. of. Was there a know, bit of a novelty as well when you go to places that are I think so initially but then I think when different. we found it really hard to get out of there <laughs> the novelty three, was three years there. Later, like, oh look they're wheeling that fucking ball out <laughs> yeah. again round Hereford exactly, brilliant yeah. for god's sake yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheltenham's nice but I don't want to keep going yeah there. get yeah. me out of here for god's yeah. sake but um, yeah it was it was, yeah, it was a novel it was a novelty but mm. I think everybody just thought yeah we'll, you know we'll get this points deduction out of here we'll get back to zero points and then you know, we'll we'll run out and get the hell out of this league, and everything will be rosy again. Mm. And it was obviously. A little well, bit, I mean, little it, bit there's been a that. few clubs that have done that. Forest have done it. Wednesday have done it. I'm not just naming clubs that I've actually played for because <laughs> it sounds terrible. <laughs> but um, it, it's the, that that kind of cliche about them being a big scalp. I've, I've I've got memories of just Leeds turning up, and it, it must have been the majority of away grounds. Two thirds of it was Leeds fans. I mean, even if it was lads or, or people that travelled from here, but more often than not, there'd be loads in the surrounding areas just scooped up and, oh, Leeds are in town, I'll go and watch them. And it was, um, that b- kind of backing was great. And again, the sense of it being um, a big football club playing in front of a lot of people. I mean, it's funny, you do get that um, kind of question asked sometimes about playing in front of big crowds, but if you've been fortunate enough to do it, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, about being nervous, anxious, that's it. You said not, not really, because it's just it becomes a lovely noise. It's it, it's less of a lovely noise when you're playing crap and you and you <laughs> lose it. But give me playing in front of ten, fifteen, twenty five thousand people as opposed to two and a half when there's that one fella behind the dugout who just bats. You can hear every word he's telling you. But yeah, yeah. It, it it's about it's the kind of the feel of being at a big place and it, that it matters. Not saying it you matters to more people, at this, but. It, uh, it means more, but it matters to a lot of people at the same time. I was watching Chelsea, uh, Man United last night. Why? Because <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, who, who on earth were you rooting for in that game? No, just what, what, <laughs> the sinkhole. <laughs> the sinkhole <laughs> opens up. They were over that or um, some some about trains. Which is so in B one, I think, weren't it? <clears throat> so yeah, but then there were one bit. Um, I think Hazard. I think he ran the ball out, and then they were a Chelsea fan. And it, it, this Chelsea fan looks like quite close to him. And he sort of said, the, definitely the words fuck off were in there. <laughs> I just saw Hazard turn around and he just want, it's like Hazard just wanted to tell him to fuck off back. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, you say about like playing in front of 20,000 people mm. and oh, well, 40,000 at Stamford Bridge, but then you still get, still the, get the one, yeah. One or two is that... Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a bit of a digression, it's a different debate, but in that sense, um, and... But as we've seen, lines being crossed over the course of the season at Chelsea a couple of times. Um, there's, there's that. The, the one thing I've never understood about that is that real recoiling horror. If he did say it back to him, you yeah. can't. Well, yes, you can say yeah, that yeah. to him. Yeah, just because you're paying money, and you're going an absolute. It's like someone, and it's. I mean, it's. I mean, like I said, it's a bit of a digression about the interaction between crowds, and uh, I mean, God forbid, one player reacts to somebody yeah. doing something like giving it. The air, or don't celebrate in front of the fans. Why they've been battering it? Don't t- you don't even think about taking your shirt off as well. <laughs> what on earth are you doing? It's just completely ass about face, I think. No, I have to agree. I mean, <clears throat> I always remember one interaction at uh, Leeds Huddersfield Town, which is obviously a feisty derby, mm. not for next year though. Um, and um, <laughs> I was sat on the halfway line in the east stand, and Gary Roberts, who were playing for Huddersfield at the time. He's got a fair set of listeners on him, hasn't he? He's, you know, he's, <laughs> he'd make a good double for FA Cup. Anyway, he's uh, players stopped. He's sort of on the touchline. And this rather rotund gentleman outside of me stood up and went to the effects of, oh, there's not a fucking decent window. You're going to take off with them. <laughs> and in fairness to him, he just turned around and went, nice one, sit down, fatty. <laughs> that's his go. And the guy just applauded him and yeah, sat yeah. down. And I thought, yeah, that's you know, exactly it's that. class. Yeah. Exactly. If you're going to dish it out, expect to get it back. Yeah. I mean... Chris Wood's a prime example that leads him in, in, in the recent years. He was getting some pelters for missing chances and then he scored an overhead kick against Fulham in the 91st minute, 92nd minute. Cupped his ear to the cop, never looked back. Would you would you get dragged along? I can understand not like a mob mentality type of thing, but if there's a general kind of... If you're watching a game... I, I mean, I get frustrated watching football matches, but if you're watching a game, you've, you've turned up, you've paid, 
And for some reason, it feels like the same person's doing the same thing, which is not quite floating everyone's boat. Would would you get caught up in groans, perhaps? That, that things everyone understands. Yeah, about, everyone understands so. a misplaced oh, pass. It's like oh god. But if it's if it's a specific player who's trying to do the hardest thing on a football pitch, but making it look even harder by missing, and I presume from your point of view, it must be quite hard if it's something that you're seeing. I've called Leeds players dickheads a lot of times. <laughs> this is when I was running late tonight. <laughs> Where is that dickhead? I think. Yeah, I think it is easy to get sort of caught up along the sort of atmosphere of the game, isn't it? A lot yeah. of the time. And I think a lot of the time, Chris Wood, we'll use Chris Wood as an example. Mm. Before he hit that goal scoring glut, he was guilty of missing some pretty good chances mm. on a regular mm. occasion. And I think that the issue didn't come with particularly the way he was playing, the particular the form he was in. Mm. It was just that it's frustration that that's a chance we should have took. Yeah. Not, not particularly that it's just Chris Wood, it was just a chance that, you know could have changed the game or whatever mm-hmm. and it just seems to be the same person that and all the as time. As a team we were sort of struggling as well because Chris yeah. Wood weren't scoring them goals. Well it was just before, it was it was around the time when Gary Monk was being asked about the, the team having an identity, mm-hmm. if you remember. And then he changed it and went sort of four at the back and we never looked back that season mm-hmm. to, to pretty much Do you think until, until the end of the until season. The end of the season. season. You, I mean when you saw, because that's the, the buzzwords out there like identity and philosophy and uh, the, what what a team does on a football pitch. I mean, and, and it's not just trying to like explode the myth of what coaching is, but fundamentally it's 11 players that are picked, hoping that each of the players extremely well, everything that you plan in the week comes off. So when you, when you say, when we hear identity, I mean, I know that Bielsa has brought something to lead. Maybe it is an identity that, that is brought to lead. But from my, from if you looked at it from the point of view of what has he done, he's made a group of players that were prone to inconsistency, more consistent over a longer period of time. It's also made them, this sounds stupid, run around faster and more. Mm. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the whole closing down yeah. thing at Wigan, where there's about 17 players chasing one <laughs> player who's, who's looking around going, what the fuck is going on? I don't know where you've all come from. Yeah, yeah we, we looked at a game a couple of weeks later where perhaps energy levels were down a bit and I can't remember which team it was, but there's a player running through and he's only got two players closing down. So that that to me is, is made it as... Simple as possible, because you need the the further you get up the footballing pyramid, players the superstars that get, that get paid the big bucks because they can do things with the football that not many people can. There's superstars that get paid the big bucks because the manager knows he's going to get seven or eight out of ten of them every single week. He can trust them, and trust is a big thing. So it seems to me what he's done is brought players on, given them something to follow, and it's reaped the rewards, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. yeah, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. I don't think you can see that with any any sort of team. I mean. Going back to last night with Man United, that they've just had 14 games under Oli Solskjaer, and they're like a different side, mm. all because of a, well, they're putting it down to they trust the manager, mm. the manager trusts them, and that is is how you can break it down to something as simple as that, mm-hmm. and that is football is a simple game. Mm. Until you start complicating it, yeah, really, which is what players tend to do. They like yeah. to come. That's that's what it is, and it's almost a justification for being on the pitch and, and and sticking to what you're good at uh, and making it as simple as possible I think is is a great it's not a trick because he's not a magician but he's a very um, hard working taskmaster and I think it's great you know when you hear about oh they've done triple sessions and all this type of stuff I'd be sat in the pub going shit yeah of course <laughs> they're doing that <laughs> they're p- paid handsomely they've just had six weeks off that's what you're going to have to do between now and the end of the season and I, and I know it sounds slightly hypocritical when you've been a football yourself but that, you, you never begrudge what is classed as hard work in football because get your head down for nine months you could be a Premier League player come the end, yeah. of, the, end of that season and I think going back to what you say about fans getting on players backs I think as a as a lead as a lead fan base I think the bare minimum we ask is just 100% effort mm-hmm. and I think a lot of the if you look at like cult heroes that, that have come through the club a lot of them weren't the best technical players, mm-hmm. but they've got cult heroes because they came out and they gave 100% mm-hmm. every every game. And you knew you were going to get that mm-hmm. from it. And you won't get collective grounds. Yeah, you'll get the odd person who says, oh, yeah, I know he's a trier, but he's just mm. not good enough or whatever. But the collective Leeds fans as a whole, you know, whether they're at the game or whether on social media or anything like that, if a player gives it all, give it all mm. then, then... You don't have it, to be the best. No. I don't I, think that'll ever... It, it seems to me at Leeds, I don't think that'll ever change. I mean, I... I what you're saying that I, I mean, I can vouch for in the sense of 
I always played football a certain way and, and knew my limitations. And it's um, there's a there's a general a touch word. I've, every Leeds fan that I've ever met who has a, a, the tiniest inkling of that I might have played for them um, has been wonderful. No one's walked up to me and gone, "Oh my god, you got on my nerve." <laughs> the, the, the kind of they give you a, a, that kind of um, look of your eye, as as they say. You did run around a bit, then you go, yeah, it's fair enough, yeah, they did it. But they they did it, in, they do it in a way because they appreciate. And it does sound very to especially nowadays when your footballers are at the top end are as far removed from perhaps the man in the street as possibly mm. could be. Um, there's there's no substitute for getting on the pitch, putting the shirt on, and giving a shit. There's, yeah. you know what I mean? It, it's I think, and like I said, it sounds twee, but you can't come away from the fact of what it would mean for one of you fellas to someone go, do you know what? Do you not come and sign for these? For, Two years, but what? <laughs> Where do I sign? And that's why I was like, "Yeah, give me the pen and the paper. Let's get on with it. It's great." How much do you think Bielsa's reputation will have, will have had an influence on the lads in terms of? Because a bit's been made of this in terms of we we maybe have got, and I want to choose my words carefully. Here, we maybe now have got a, a manager in charge or a coach in charge whose reputation is very similar to the club he, which is in charge of in terms of, you know, he is this big grand figure mm. sort of worldwide who's coached some of the biggest clubs, you know, up and down the land and had fair enough limited success in terms of not won, won many trophies. Mm. But how, how much like do you us. think... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like us. How, how much do you think that will have, as a former player, when you sort of get in that type of person? I think the, the, there probably been maybe the younger element that might have been semi-scratching the Reds, but the minute that Simeone comes out, Guardiola comes out, Pochettino comes out and starts kind of vouching for him, not that he needs validation, but when you've got a generation of coaches that are as good as that, then suddenly they're going, oh, right, Christ, he must he must be pretty decent if people are picking him out. And I know exactly what you mean. The, 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 so the likes of, with the greatest respect, the David Hockaday, um, even when I spoke to Eki about it, I mean, he couldn't, Barnsley manager, and Leeds say, do you want to, yes. He said, I couldn't turn it down. I could not turn that job down. But the way it kind of transpires, and he, he, he went through quite a tricky period when he was in, then a tricky period in the summer when it was all kind of um, done. It was done contractually, from what I gather, in the correct manner, but in a, in a way that still probably um, isn't the most straightforward kind of yeah. thanks for that time for shepherding us over here. Um, well, no it, one wants it to get sacked on holiday. Well, that, that, that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, sack him at the end of the season. Yeah. Don't, don't move a, a trip to wherever they were going. and What's then on Myanmar? And then say, yeah. oh, by the way, can, but can you look after the lads there, basically? And then when you come back, we'll say cheers. And, and I, I and, and but that's the brutal nature of football. But I think you're absolutely right, guys, in the, in the sense of um, how, how well Gary Monk did. I thought he did a good job. And then, like we said, to a point, that season completely fell away. Thomas Christensen. You know what I mean? He's, he's been a manager of Leeds United, which is a privileged position. But someone like Marcelo comes in. Because when you first there, I mean, we must have all sat there and gone, there's no chances going. Well, my initial thought was, I have no idea who this person is. Uh, I'll be honest, yeah, yeah. hand on heart, I was like, I've, I've mm. never heard of this yeah. guy. But I kept seeing the, the you know, people, mm. uh, Guillaume Balaguer was one of the first tweets mm-hmm. I saw. Marcello, uh, the, the Marcello Bielsa to Leeds could happen. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have a look at this. And I found like a two-hour coaching masterclass for the Aspire Academy, ironically, that are linked to Leeds, mm. uh, on YouTube. And, and then the more and more I dug and more and more I found articles and like articles by you know big names and stuff, I was like, wow, this guy's, you know. And then I went to that interview where I was like, nah, nah that's not going to happen. Surely not. <laughs> and uh, we had Bryn Law on the show. Yeah, and Bryn yeah. Law was like, nah, that's not happening. Yeah. yeah, he's not coming. That's definitely not happening. And then like, um, sort of a week, 10 days later, they're, they're announcing him as, as manager of Leeds United. And you think, shit. We just got this this duty, and then and my first thought of that was, God, I hope we don't break him because that's what we do. <laughs> so we do pretty much well, everything else. The other side of it is you read about. I mean, the, uh, the last couple of jobs as well, where he's been there five minutes, five months, whatever, and just God, do you know what I'm off? And that's probably when you heard the kind of um, the chat between the two of them in this uh, between his camp and Leeds camp about how long it took, and then figures involved, which are always kind of media speculation and ballpark, but you kind of led to believe that. It's one of, if, if not the highest paid Leeds United manager that they've ever had, which yeah. if you're going to do a job properly, you make sure that you get all the boxes ticked and everything in your way, which he seems to have done. Yeah, I mean, um, we were led to believe when negotiations first started that they couldn't actually get him to talk about money. They couldn't actually get him to sit down and right. nail down what he wanted to be paid because he was too interested in the football side of things, how Fantastic. he wanted to implement his 
is, you know, his philosophy, if you like, and we've talked about already, but how he wanted to implement his way of being able to do things. Mm. And they said for ages that they actually struggled to pin him down and say, can we actually talk about now how much you want to get yeah, paid? Yeah. So it like rumbled on and on and on due to that reason that he just wanted to talk about how he could improve leads and what he wanted to do if mm. he was going to become manager and all this type of stuff. And there was like haggling then going, well, all right, but I'm sure I'm paying kind of thing. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, being the type of guy he is, six million a year would be led to believe is on around some, <laughs> some of that. That words to that effect, I think, was was a number. That get you quite high up the Premier League as well, from yeah. a wages point of view. To be fair, yeah, and uh, obviously we've seen I that, that, in, that he got for his whole team. Though. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say he's got like 25 sort Get of first guys. teams <laughs> spies <laughs> and yeah, um, and various other people, and that that kind All of the brings different disguises that he's got. Yeah, definitely. But then the genuine excitement for me when he came was, oh well, we we're bound to go sign some brilliant players because mm. there's no way he'll come here. And, and Without assurances, and, yeah, yeah, exactly, and and not get like you say, he left Lazio within two days mm. because they didn't go out and buy the players that he said that he wanted. Mm. And you're thinking, brilliant. And then we don't sign <laughs> anyone. <laughs> Nobody turns up. And then he's done this yeah. with this play, these players who who Eckingbottom and Christensen couldn't get a tune, mm. not to the same degree. I, I think, and it just goes to show how bloody good he is. I think the first time I realised that this were a bit different when the same team that played the end of last season mm. smashed Derby. A, a game where Derby wanted to try and outpass us like we eventually did to them. Mm. That was the first time I really sat back and thought, and Shit. Stoke on the other day as well. Yeah. You know, what, what, superb, has this, what has yeah. this guy done? You know yeah. what I mean? It was, mm. it was it, Stoke initially, I was like, nah, it might be just a bit, yeah, of, a, bit of a first Stoke, season bounce, yeah, you know, big stadium, Stoke well. shit, that type <laughs> of thing. Uh, and then like Derby was the one that was like, oh, Jesus Christ, would, you know, he's. Frank Lampard, Stabby. Frank Lampard, you, know, you can't, know, yeah, can't discuss it in any other way. Well, I mean, so from that point of view, when you do watch. The same players doing doing better things, which is as simple as that sounds. Uh, what is it? I mean, better decision making. Do they do they appear like they're carrying themselves in a different way? Is there more well, they're, confidence? The fitter, mm. so that's a, without a shadow of a doubt. The, the, like the you say, they're, they're, well. they're, there's definitely confidence. You can tell what they're doing on the training pitch is then translated. So it, it's it's just it staggers me to hear this type of thing mm. because. I'd, I'd be sat there tearing me out, going, "If is that all it is? Working on a training ground to make sure if you went, I mean, Christ, if you turn up, whatever job you do, your boss goes, what we're we doing today? But <laughs> don't know, mate, just crack on. Yeah, just do something. Give a shout before you go, so at least I know you've been here, and then see what happens. <laughs> and then on Saturday, we'll chuck you all together and see if we can do some of, of any form of kind of relevance. And I think... Um, it's a fundamental of football. You have to be organised. You have to be able to know what you're doing. I mean, regardless of it, I mean, the best one in the country, if not probably the world, well, Guardiola. Oh, I mean, yes, she's got world-class players, but they all know what to do because they're drilled. And that's, mm. it's, it's bizarre to think that that's what, that because it's, it's a relatively straight line between doing that and good performance. Yeah, I mean, we've heard of things like he runs training by 25-minute segments. So he'll take the lads in, analyse a 25-minute segment of the opposition then he'll go out and drill that 25-minute segment for 15 minutes or so, mm. where they'll stop it, bring him in, show him an iPad, and you know, show him the different movements, different changes, all this type of stuff. Mm. And then that's how the sort of build-up to the game goes, where they'll work through the 25-minute segments. And mm. I mean, we'll come on to it in a minute, because we kind of after, because we've got you here. But Spygate, I think the media briefing that he gave post-Spygate, which I think me and you were exchanging a text on that exact night, because I thought he was going to resign, um, was... You know, they just showed to the level of detail. And that was purely just talking about analysing another team. That weren't even getting down to the crux of coaching, the mm. crux of how mm. he gets his message across and how he sort of quality assures. Because I'm led to believe in training, he doesn't really have that much influence. It's his team that, that influenced the training. Well, I, th I think from that point of view as well, from when you hear about how long these, these uh, meetings and stuff and all that type of st stuff, what it... What it boils down to, down to fundamentally is a player needs to go on the pitch knowing that he will have the majority of the answers to the questions that are posed in a game. Whether that's um, who am I marking, that's quite straightforward. Where do I need to kind of be when this player's got the ball? A lot of football, yes, is off the cuff, but the structural side of it, of what a formation is and, and from set pieces, which you can kind of break down a little bit, I think it gives, it gives um, a player a certain comfort factor to go on the pitch because what it is is problem solving. That general consensus that footballers are daft. I mean, Christ almighty, I have met some daft footballers. <laughs> but I've also met some daft people in the street. But 
Keith that, Andrews. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to come on to well, Keith and see, see how well regarded he's on it. Um, but the um, that that kind of what the they're being constantly asked questions at quite a, a quick turnover in a game, and they've got to constantly have the answers from. Yeah. Otherwise, a pass goes astray, or the or the split second tackles wrong, or your you man gets a run on you on a corner, free kick, whatever. So, I think. And some of them are, are just pure instinct. Wayne Rooney is one that's just you feel is pure instinct. Yes, he's phenomenal football. Yes, he's he's um, he's, he's played in teams and with players that are, are extremely extremely good. But his in- instinct for knowing what to do at the right time and doing it in a split second, I think, is is fascinating to try and work out. I mean, Christ, whether you'd sit down and have a conversation with him is a completely different thing. Yeah. But um, so what he, he seems to have done, Bielsa is given. I'm not saying they've got every answer to every problem because you can never have that. But it seems the players know more often than not what to do when, when, whenever the kind of situation occurs. Well, on Phil Hayes' podcast, they had a um, a young coach on uh, recently who was come up from America. I think he's coaching mm. in co- um, in college over there. And while he was back over in England, he actually um, witnessed a, a Bielsa a coaching session, mm. and he was saying that the drills that they were doing were. They were switching positions all the time. So so you weren't just learning what you had to do in your job, but mm-hmm. you were, like you're saying, football's off the cuff. So you might end up in a position where you weren't before. So they were switching them and, and then drilling them. Mm-hmm. And they were only doing it for 30, 40 seconds. Then they would switch again. And and it's just goes to show how... And, and then you see it on the pitch because you see how we overload a side. And you mm. see a full-back, you know, at the byline. And and all those positions where you think, well, actually, you shouldn't. But but that's how we want to play, and they're all so drilled mm-hmm. and the way to do it. So you'll see certain things like I, I think it was the uh, the last game at Ellen Road. We had the ball around the back, like Cooper to Janssen and what have you, and then all of a sudden, Alioski from left back just ran across the field. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, there's, there's got that. to be something in that to make him run yeah, in yeah. that direction yeah. because. You wouldn't just do it out of <laughs> so think, oh, getting numbers up. Yeah, <laughs> sod it. I'm going to run over there. Rate right fast for me. Bad peroxide. But I, I think yeah. what, what happens with that as well. I mean, it, it does develop an appreciation of perhaps what someone in your team needs to do. Like if you're a winger and the fullback's constantly seeing your number, then I tell you what, swap positions. And if you're looking up, going, I can constantly see his number. I've got nobody to fucking pass to it. Then suddenly he goes, oh, well, hang on, maybe I've moved my body so he can actually I can make eye contact with him. There's a coherence there that. Um, I think without getting too deep about it, it, it forms a, an empathy within the team. You understand. I mean, bar it, bar it the goalkeeper, we just leave him to it. Christ Almighty, <laughs> just hold on to the ball, lads. That's all we want. You know what I mean? Um, and then you look at how that kind of integrates. And even you look at Alioski is a good example when he's when he's a very attack minded player. There's been several games where I've watched where suddenly his crossing's got hell of a lot better when he's been shoved back 20 yeah, yards. Yeah, it's does. suddenly like, I can yeah, see yeah. things a bit better. Calvin Phillips, same thing. He's played as a 10. He's not a 10. He's played as a holding midfield. You think, Jesus Christ, this kid can dictate a game. Plays even further back. And he's, you know what I mean, he's shouting to Ponce. You know what I mean? Ordering people around and growing in confidence in where he is. So there's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with adjusting your position. Your position at... 17, 18 in the youth team is not your position for life and your appreciation of what the rest of the team needs. I think Calvin's a great example of that, how he's grown um, as the team's grown this season, that he's um, a, 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 a lad that wants to learn, enjoys learning and has appreciated the time and effort that's been put into him and also dealt with that, that the lad who gets hooked after half an hour. People can crumble on that. Mm. That's almost like he's, part of it, yes, Bielsa reacts to the game in real time, doesn't wait till half time, right? You need to come off because you're not working in this. But fundamentally, you also know if you're coming off after half an hour, you're not having the best game of your life. Yeah. You, it might be a tactical thing, but you, you're not doing well. But And I think part of that is almost subconsciously, it's almost like, well, I'll, you to stress test what a younger player can deal with. Because everyone, everyone watching the game goes, oh, shit, he's come off there. But then comes back the next week, starts, plays very well. I think it's been wonderful. Yeah, I agree. We're, we're kind of reaping the rewards with Calvin Phillips at the minute. I think if you if you ask many Leeds fans, he's probably one of the first names off if everybody's lips at the moment, mm. particularly in that holding role, the number four, as Bielsa mm. likes to call it. He's, I mean, we saw it against Swansea. Um, we touch on the Swansea game. He, mm. he, 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 he was a, a world different to what we've had in with Adam Forshaw playing there, and that's not Adam Forshaw's a bad player. Mm. He just doesn't have the same attributes as what as what um, Calvin Phillips. But would you have said that about Calvin? A year ago, absolutely not. Ago. No, I, 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 I started put Calvin in that that box of. I'm not quite sure where he fits in here. Mm. Yeah, he's a youth player. Yeah, he's got talent, but 
where where do we where mm. do we harvest that talent? Uh, is he is he a ten who, who bangs free kicks in because he's done that in the past? Is mm. he you know is he is he a, is he a midfield destroyer? What what is he? And then Bielsa's obviously recognised some certain attributes, pushed him into that holding uh, role. It's and a good point you made there, Gary, because I think there's a there is that default set, isn't there? Is a is is one is one of our own? You know, what I mean, yeah. we've fostered and nurtured him so. Inherently, there's that bit more rope that you let him kind of play with, but there is a tipping point for that. He gets to 21, 22, mm. and he's not pulling up trees, and it's like he's been here too long, needs to move on. You know what I mean? Pastures new, all that type of stuff. If you so, ask, ask Leeds fans in summer, I think they'd want to. Would have gladly gone. Them, yeah, they got rid of him. Well, a lot of them complained when Ronnie Vieira went to Sampdoria and Calvin Phillips stayed. A lot of them said we'd rather got rid of Calvin Phillips and kept Ronnie Vieira. And I think Phil A mentioned it on their podcast, or to be honest, all podcasts merge into one. <laughs> but they were saying that. Um, they we were talking to Eckingbottom, actually, mm-hmm. you mentioned him, and they were talking about um, Ronnie Vieira, and, and Eckingbottom said, yeah, Ronnie Vieira is a pure athlete. You know, mm-hmm. he, he is the, he, you know, he is a, he's a proper specimen of a man, an athlete. Mm. But Calvin Phillips is the more, he believed he was the more uh, sort of talented of, mm. the, of the pair. And that, uh, and I think every coach uh, mm-hmm. in recent every times have all said they were all looking forward it. to working with Calvin Phillips. So I think that speaks volumes for him. It does. I, think, does. I mean, uh, perhaps from it, maybe... <coughs> Because what is he? He's just come up 100 games, just over 100 games, just 10 21. So he's got a good kind of bank of games under his belt. And then after that, I think you get to a point where the influences that you get between 15 to 20 are very, very, very fundamental and they stay there for life. After that, your career's your own responsibility. Maybe something like that. I mean, I only very briefly said hello to the lad before and he. he very genial, lovely lad. I mean, when we try and obviously the media side of it, which is perhaps what um, the 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 higher up branch of what Leeds is, <laughs> they're sometimes um, not the easiest to deal with. But um, players good as gold. He's always been one that stepped forward and said his bit, and, um, and and been very honest about his position and everything that we've asked him. So I think that shows a, a sign, of maybe a, a, a growing maturity in a player that's been quite mature for a long time. Yeah, we've we've started seeing particularly this year where they've pushed him sort of. No, no, they've not pushed him. He's pushed himself a little bit. We've seen a lot of stuff like, you know, I, I hate saying the word in the community, but mm. you know, a lot of stuff that you know he's, done, he's turned up on a telly program the other day to give a young fan a VIP tour, and I'm led to believe he did that completely off his own, own back, back. Yeah. not not pushed by the club. Seeing other little videos popping up where he, you know he's taking a shirt around someone's house, and yeah, it's all little things, but these are the things that endear him more yeah. to a fan. We see him blood, sweat, and tears on a Saturday, giving his all, which you can never ever fault, fault him for that. Mm. And then we see that other sort of nice bit. And, it builds into the bigger package of he's one of our own. Mm. You know, he's got leads at his at his heart. I would imagine. You know, he's and he's got everything else that comes with it, kind of thing. And like you rightly said, it does give them type of players a bit of a longer lead. To the point though, sometimes where Leeds fans forget when it's time to cut that lead. Yeah, we've yeah. seen recently when Leeds hit a bit of a bit of a slump, bit of a bad patch. With a person playing in the ten weren't really doing it. Should we bring Alex Moit back now? The greatest will and respect in the world to Alex Moit, who's a fantastic footballer. Um, He's not quite at the level for Leeds just yet, but right. instantly go back to his Leeds product. He did mm. really well for us in the time that he was in there in a in a failing team. Let's be honest, but instantly it's let's bring him back. Mm. And I think sometimes we, rightly so, we give academy products longer and we give them a bit more rope because they are one of our own. But also there is levels to this game, and and, and the lads so. will ultimately find the level eventually. Sure. And, and it's you know. Eventually, like you said, that tipping point kind of runs out eventually. Mm. I remember um, speaking to Neil Redfern about it. it was Mo, Alex Moat and Lewis Cook that it was because he'd obviously overseen their de- development for quite a long time. And I think, if I remember rightly, I, and I hope I've got this the right way around, and, it, and it's no slight on what Redders was saying about either of them, but he was more convinced about Moat being a Premier League player than he was Cook. Now, they both kind of blossomed at the same time. I mean, slightly different attributes, but both very good on the ball, but... What I, what you saw with Cook was the type of pace that sits quite nicely in the Premier League, especially in midfield nowadays. Mm, I mean, yeah. if you're not big and powerful, you've got to be quick and very good on the ball, which yeah. he, he he is. I mean, it's unfortunate that right now he's obviously dealing with quite a long term injury, but um, it's just it's just a me- it, he's so that was said at a snapshot in time. Maybe with the with the Vieira thing, it was said at a snapshot in time. He looks the better player, but then they all develop at different times, and and you and you see. And that's another thing that you got to applaud Bielsa for. You said earlier on about them not getting players, but then when things have kind of hit a bit of the buffers with injuries, I mean, you get... I mean, Kiss. The amount of lads that they chucked on, it's like, Christ, he, he looks no more than 14. What yeah. on earth is going on? They're getting younger and younger. Yeah. And the only way you'll find out if they're any good, chuck them in front of 20,000 people. And yeah. someone will just go, my God, this is not for me. 
But the majority from what I've seen have been fine. We, oh. We've dealt with 40, with Roof now, 46. 46. Yeah. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Injuries this unbelievable. Year. And it's just been, next like you say, next man up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. They, whether they come through the academy and never played for Leeds and... Mm-hmm. The th- you know they're thrown in the bear pit of Ellen Road, which and the expectations there this yep. year, and it's sold out every every week. They've all got the attitude that it doesn't phase them, mm-hmm. and they and they're all like you say drilled to the to the same as the first team because I believe they all train with the first mm-hmm. team as well. That's and imperative just, that and, they, and they get and they get and obviously be able to trust them that they'll go in there and do the job. Well, we we got Jamie Shackleton on last week, and obviously seen him play a lot of times, but never been that close to him. And uh, somebody what was like in. in Person. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah. great lad, honestly, really, really, really good lad. Um, but like somebody tweeted us afterwards from a photo porn saying he looks like he should be at home playing Fortnite, <laughs> and, and uh, I, he had a picture of my son, and he actually shocked me. Yeah. His sort of his stature, but then he came on at, um, against Swansea, and you know he, he looked like one of the best players on the pitch for the short period of time he was on there. Mm. And he, he, to me, and it, it's a it's a grand sort of uh, compliment for the lad. But I'd hold him in a similar realm to Lewis Cook he has got mm. very much similar attributes to Lewis Cook he's got that low centre of gravity mm. he's got a great turn of pace he's, he's, he's good with the ball he don't waste it and he's very direct and you know he's just he, he, he epitomises what we've just talked about you know alright that, that one's broke uh, wheel out a child then how do you feel <laughs> being a child <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that young no, I'm not that young do, what, do you think that this endless what appears to be a Sort of conveyor belt of youngsters coming in and filling sides can continue. Yeah, the way it has. why can't it? Why can't Although it? Although we're saying the the side, because we're about Cook and, and Moa and all them, and then there was a side. I don't think it's maybe the one the eighteens that are coming through now mm. are supposed to be better than some of them players. And if that's to continue, then I would just a squad of really good players. <laughs> <laughs> this is another thing that Bielsa has brought within, though, isn't it? Is because. When it when we were first coming about, he's already got the blueprints for Thorpe Arch. You were looking at developing Thorpe Arch, and with that comes developing young talent. And I think that was one of the main kind of things that he wanted to do. So, you know, for whatever time he's going to be with us, whether it be a year, two year, three year, I think we'll reap the rewards long term, and we'll see this play development come through, mm. and we'll see the best of it yet is yet to come. I think. And I think it's also a testament to Victor Orta's job as well, um, because when this new ownership took over, the academy was an afterthought. It had been running to the ground and there was massive gaps in yeah. in player talent there. And they've gone out there and bought quite a few um, of those players that we're now seeing some of them coming into the into the first team. Yeah, I mean, we bought them at 423 levels because we needed to, because we weren't producing it, them. Because that, that, that must have felt like a bit of a red herring then. Because you look at the the position of, of or his title of in the football club, I think perhaps us in the media were guilty of looking at whoever he brought in for the first team. And there was... A kind of like a tranche of players that you kind of scratching your heads a little bit, going, not really heard of them. Don't really know what they're going to do, to be honest. But again, may, maybe maybe we sold them short by saying, well, these instant ones, and maybe you, you could, almost fell into the of uh, the trap of not necessarily what a fan would think. But you see someone come in for money, you go, come on then. Yeah. If if you're mid twenties, you should go straight into the team. That's why Leeds United bought you, not mm-hmm. bought you to fanny around developing, but. Maybe the better job that is done away from the kind of the spotlight is mm-hmm. bringing players through of a certain age that are bedded in and know exactly what to do. Hundred percent. And you know he doesn't have a perfect record with the first team mm. that plays, and, and you know you don't see as many from the twenty three. So there might be some that they've brought in who, who haven't made the grade. Um, but ultimately, I think some of, most of his signings for the first team have been good. Mm. And like, and we're really reaping the rewards mm. from the academy. And like I say, he had to do. It was a big rebuilding job for that academy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, over the last two years, I went down and watched under twenty threes at Wednesday last Tuesday, which is a bit awkward. <laughs> Wednesday <laughs> happened, um, and you look at some of the talent coming through, and the the twenty threes play the same way the first team do, mm-hmm. pretty much identical, really, in, in the way that they try and try and sort of play the game, if you like. Mm. But looking just to name a few, Alfie McCalmott looks like a proper player. Um, Robbie Gotts looked impressive when I've seen him. Uh, it was a young lad called Bobby Camwa. I'm very impressed with him. He, I think he was under 18s last year, and he, he's come in and. You know, again, you know, just going back to Ben's point about, uh, I think it was Neil Redfern who originally said that the crop below the crop that we kind of broke through now are mm. even more talented than the sort of the crop coming through now. And mm. like we said, the under twenty threes are starting to see them rewards. Plus the people he brought in, Jordan Stevens, he brought in from Forest Green, Ryan Edmondson. A lot forget that he came in from York. Mm. You know, he's a Leeds fan, but mm. came in from York. Um, 
Uh, Dave Davis. The kid Pascal Struick, I think, has got a, a, a good like potential him. of a career in a game. Uh, Hugo Diaz d- does a good job. You know, and the, these are type of Apple Helm, you know, players that we brought in, and he was like, who's this? Mm. Who's this kid? And why is he not playing it first team? Exactly yeah. that point you make. So, yeah, I think Victor Otto probably should get a little bit more credit than, than he did. But I think one of the biggest blots on, uh, it depends how you look at it, mm. on this season has obviously been the Spygate saga. So, what did yeah. you make of? What can no longer be called the Spygate saga because it's over. It can't, it's been done. Yeah. Um, what, as in how it all, the original incident? Yeah. Um, so that first time when Frank Lampard came out and said, Leeds have been spying on us. Well, we were all... What were your thoughts? Well, so it was happened on the Friday, didn't it? So we were watching it. I was down at Sky in the office because we were doing a show like that night. And then the kind of the first part of it ran and then it was said... About because it, it was all like very kind of cloak and dagger. Then was, he said, "Oh, he'd come out and actually said that he'd done it." And so mm. we're all sat there like a god going, "This is someone who does it slightly differently," <laughs> um, and just kind of shrugged his shoulders. I mean, yeah, as is, as has been the main word that's been um, used a lot is the culture side of it. So Frank Lampard looked pretty distraught to be honest, didn't he? Whereas um, Marcelo threw his through his interpreter. Which I think is it's a master stroke, isn't it? Because I mean, we do some post match stuff. Where it's like, come on. <laughs> so he, he, the question gets asked, it gets interpreted, gets come back. There's been a couple of times when is you can tell he's heard the interpretation. Going, no, 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 no. Yeah. He said the same thing again in something, and you're like, you know exactly what you're yeah. saying, you bugger. But um, <laughs> yeah, he plays that well. Yeah, really well. And now her reporter's going, what? What did I start? What question did I start with? <laughs> um, but and to come out and say it, I, I thought. Helped him get ahead of perhaps the onslaught that came. I still the the kind of finite details of what did occur then of somebody outside a training ground where you can quite clearly see what's going on. I don't. I, if you're that bothered, I don't know why there isn't. As everyone kind of says, the ten foot high conifers that would be there if you're that particularly bothered about people watching you training. I think that the thorough element of um, what is done over the course of the season reflects the number of staff that he's got at his disposal, um, reflects how, how honestly he's taken the league, and also the fact that would he have known too much about championship teams before coming over here? Not, you wouldn't presume a lot. Mm. Um, so I think I think because, maybe maybe because of the element of what it was with Leeds United, um, I think part of it was probably blown out of proportion. I can understand why football purists in England were pissed off, but I can also understand... Coming from coming from his background of, um, it's been done before, so it's part of his kind of manifesto of what makes a, a successful manager. I find it interesting you say football purists in England. Yeah, but that's it's a particularly English reflection that we've had to that, isn't it? The reaction is to to is we that. is we do it a certain way. We've always done it a certain way, so we're affronted. Yeah, it's like reading the Daily Mail. Like you read all the stuff that's in that, and there's people that are affronted by every single thing that they're possibly affronted mm. by. So then when you get into the nitty gritty of why, why, why are you, um, why are you pissed off? Cause you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Well, there's a school of thought that you shouldn't do it, but show me the rule yeah. and the law that says you can't do it. That's why when it comes to giving out the punishment, you, you're punishing someone on what on, on your interpretation of what that actually is. Mm. So like when I say the football period, because it's, is it, under the sense of in the spirit of the game it's not but I mean now there's diving now there's getting booked on purpose yeah. now there's time wasted time wasted now now there's calling your opposite number every single name under the sun mm-hmm. using every abhorrent swear yeah. word that you could possibly use now you know what I mean all that type of stuff is not in the spirit turning your dressing room's pink exactly or t- <laughs> turning the heating up in a dressing room so yeah. everyone's sweating the tits off before they even get out there uh, What's what's the spirit of the game? All shaking hands and jolly hockey sticks before and after, and there will be a school of thought that that's what football's like. Football's not like that at all. Yeah, it's a ru- it. it's a ruthless business, mm-hmm. and it's um, it, I'm not saying across the board that the romance is and it's gone or the love and it's gone, but it's not. But at the highest level, it will eat you up and it will absolutely spit you out. So mm-hmm. you, you've got to be battle hardened to it. Yes, we all return a romance of what the game is, but I think. The, the element of, of how almost kind of morally judging him for it, I think it takes it completely out of context. Mm. Yeah. What what do you make of um, Lampard's accusations, you know, with the bolt cutters um, and police being on the ground? Well, I've, had, I've had two ground. schools of thought. I've, not two, I've had two opinions on that. One was um, that local police force categorically said that 
that man didn't have any of that on him. Yeah. So whether that's hearsay, whether what they said is, I mean, it gave him a, a, a farcical element to what it was. I mean, yeah, yeah. What, I mean, what on earth would he have done with that? Well, I mean, exactly. the minute it, it gets in there and trespasses, then then that is illegal. Yeah. Mm. Stood by a bush next to a road <laughs> isn't. But and then then obviously when he when he came out and and kind of gave that an hour and a half, two hour meeting, which just kind of everyone just like if 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 you're reading it. Well, as Phil was doing tweeting on the way through, and you're kind of looking at it, and you just everyone just got their scratch. I was going, "What on earth are we watching? We don't mm. really know what it is." Yeah. And and then part of me's thinking, "Well, if you're getting paid six million quid a year, you and your staff, then Christ, I'm like, you should be doing that much work. <laughs> you should know exactly what they're doing mm. because what else are you doing for the two or three days that you're not training the lads or watch it or, or playing a football match?" So I think it's. Um, I think it's probably one of the more bizarre things that we've seen, as, and that's talking about Leeds United, which <laughs> can be as bizarre as it comes. And then it comes full circle, and then so the fine that gets imposed. And I think I've, I've read Phil's comments about it being um, a sledgehammer to a was it a nut or peanut yeah, or something yeah, like that, well, yeah. um, and used the reference of the Crystal Palace game uh, a few years back in the Premier League when they got to find twenty five grand, oh, yeah. twenty five grand to a Premier, twenty five grand to a Premier League football team. What's that? Half of what the top striker earns in a week? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's nothing. There's also the Russians got fined twenty grand by FIFA for racist chanting. That is, I mean, <laughs> I think if you put that into context of when FIFA did that and how FIFA was being run, then maybe you can kind of understand yeah. why. But mm. it's questionable um, judgment calls for that. But I think, yeah, yeah I, I mean that that makes that puts it into shocking perspective. Mm. You know what I mean it, it's. Like 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 we said, it, it's done in the essence of what is the spirit of the game. I mean, I, I presume as as fans, it was all quite entertaining yeah, until everyone starts saying, "Let's get points." Dot. I mean, in our group chat, like, it was just really funny. Yeah, we, we just really enjoyed it, and I think we were maybe privy to a bit more information that it had happened a bit more, mm. and we were like, "This is ace. Mm. This, this is." This is what you should be doing, <laughs> and then you sort of think about it and think, well, all right, maybe in the sporting sort of sense that you get an advantage from what is spying, mm. but it was there's no rules there, mm. so I think it were all sort of blown out of proportion. I mean, I think after it got to the derby game mm. and. The, the the way people carried on on the TV, people carried on in the in the press, yeah, yeah. the radio, mm. points deductions, and mm. and they should replay the game. I mean, we'd love to have replayed that game again because we that was one of the best games we've seen at Ellen Road mm. this season. And it was the whole sort of after bit has then sort of become sour. I think for Leeds fans that all right, the, as you said, it, it was something he did that he probably shouldn't have done. But then it's taken, what, five weeks, six mm. weeks? And then we see a, an heavy-handed, or what feels like an heavy-handed fine being handed down by, I think... Incredibly heavy. Yeah. The, Incredibly heavy, really. The sort, of, the sort of bit that annoyed me a little was we saw some big reporters, who I won't name, when Bielsa first came in, they were regaling stories when he's in Argentina and he was paying local boys to sit up trees and watching opposition's <laughs> train. Yeah. And everything was this, you know, this really big, yeah, like, romantic and funny, story yeah, and yeah. El Loco. Yeah. And then he comes to the UK... Does something similar, and, and and they want to drive him out with flaming pitchforks. Like, mm. You know, I, I mean, I think, like Ben rightly says, we, we did laugh about it to start with, but it came as no surprise to me. Mm. If you, if you, you you know you go into his career and the sort of levels of depth, I was absolutely not shocked in the slightest that this was going on. Um, however, I, I did feel that some of the media sort of chasing up of Bielsa afterwards, and mm. some of the stuff we saw from certain media outlets. Was nothing short of shocking. If, I, if I'm really know, honest, before, shocking in some cases. Before the the Spygate thing, there was uh, Moose from from Talksport who was saying um, it was just like a joint thing, Norwich and us, that because they've got foreign managers and a few foreign players, that he wouldn't like to see us in the Premier League. Uh, it was because we, it's bad we for was, English football. Yeah, we yeah. was taking up a spot in the Premier League that an English manager could have. That's basically what he was getting at. That was his sort of. Well, sort of doesn't really make sense. No, yeah. not really. And then you no. take it apart. You look at all the like we've said, all the young players we've played. Mm. All the, I mean, we've not really got that many foreigners compared to other teams. There's five English managers or British managers in the Premier League, and 
in, in the problem in the Premier League? Why why are uh, Portuguese and mm-hmm. Spanish, Brazilian, whatever, whatever managing the why Premier League? Have, why have Man U gone for Solskjaer when Sean Dyche is available? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, yeah. just that, that's yeah. the, that's the ridiculousness of that comment, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Why, why aren't they? Go, why aren't they going for? Well, I think. I think to make that. I mean, the horse has kind of bolted with that. I mean, I don't. I don't quite understand what the what the point is. I mean, it's yeah, it'd be great if everyone lived or came from within five miles yeah. of Ellen Road. But those days but, are long. Yeah, that, that's not football anymore. No, no it's not it's, no, it's nowhere near it. But we all know that. We all understand that. We're all mm. happy with that, aren't we? That's yeah. just the way the modern world's gone. And I think. Um, <laughs> And you can't. I mean, it's the, the intangible of of what he's done of really kind of bind together a city and a and a fan base. That's justification enough mm. so far. And I think, I mean, to put it into context, you talk about derby and you look in the run up to that derby game, all that type of stuff was going on. They went into the derby game and they battered them basically. Yeah. And if that penalty had gone in in the first, if they'd been awarded the penalty in the first two minutes, then you kind of thought it could be three or four days yeah. quite quickly. Um, and I thought Frank was really good in the fact that he said, I don't want to put it, blame it for that or anything like that. But subconsciously, across the course of a week, and I know that managers are looking at this, I know what players are looking at it, because I know what managers and players are like, to look for the little thing that, right, we did the same things all week, and then we, we won, and then we did the same things all week, and then we lost. What happened? And they're like, oh, well, what about that conversation with, I had with the striker that he said he, you know, he felt a little bit, whatever. And then suddenly, uh, your mind had gone to overture. Yeah. Fuck, that's where it all came from. And it doesn't take much to, to work out what would unravel a football team. Now, from Derby's point of view, if you are um, if you end up two points off the playoffs, you know what I mean? If, if you end up a point off automatic promotion, you're well within your rights to go, you bastards. <laughs> and, like, you've done us there. You're well within your rights to say that from their point of view. It, 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 it could have no credence. It could mean absolutely nothing. But... I think as fans of, of football clubs, I think you could quite easily say the, the, the other way around. You know what I mean? If it came to the, in, you were sat there in the pub after the last game of the season and you got pipped to the, and, um, and it was the other way around and Derby had done that. I think it's human nature for everyone to sit and think. Yeah, a portion if, only, blame, it? if only that had yeah. happened in a different but way. But then you could take like, oh, there was the Dwight Gale dive the other week. Mm. Which where, was unbelievable. Yeah, he dives. Um, for I his, thought it were contact at no. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and be he awkward dived, they got a penalty ended up in a drop mm. if Forrest now finished two points outside of the playoffs mm. I mean they've reprimanded Dwight Gale for diving mm. where does it sort of stop with that if they would not have got that penalty it's oh the wife goes forever yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean if Kimara hasn't and I punched the ball into the net yeah yeah, exactly. it, it, it didn't this, it came off his chest this, um, <laughs> he improvised he that's improvised. what he did yeah. I mean conversely on the Derby thing I mean it was actually sorted out on the Thursday mm. in house because Bielsa phoned Frank Lampard mm. and admitted to it. It was actually Derby who brought it out to the yeah. media mm. that day. Now, in my opinion, that's their attempt at trying to knowing Sky are coming, knowing it's going to be talked about, yeah. knowing and and almost tried to kind of maybe because it was a massive game for both of us. Mm. We were we were coming off of, we needed a win. Mm. They needed a win. And it was almost like they were kind of, well, we'll use this as our advantage, and it backfired to them. Mm-hmm. So on the flip side of it, they could have left that in-house, and all of the Spygate Fiori wouldn't have actually happened. What did you think about, you mentioned Keith before, but what did you think about the reporter? Because, I mean, we're not going to rock up, like, all guns blazing and go, nah, we're not going to talk. We're going to yeah. go, absolutely, yeah. that's the first thing we're going to talk about. I was stood, I got to that game quite early, so I think I'm a bit excited. And, um, <laughs> to throw things. <laughs> he went to his spot, <laughs> for his yeah. Yeah. Um and one of my mates was at home watching it on TV, and he, I, the a few mates who stand with me were in that same group chat. Mm. We're all in front, and this one lad's just going, "You've got to see what Sky is saying here. <laughs> Keith Andrews is going mental. <laughs> he thinks Leeds should be blown up, and yeah. <laughs> over exaggerated a bit, but yeah. And then you go back and you watch it back, and you just think, "Wow." Yeah. Well, I mean, my I wife mean, doesn't like football, and even she phoned me as I got to the ground mm. and went. They're going mental. They're going <laughs> mental on the I, telly. I, I'll, I'll be honest, Keith's post-match mm. was bordering on ludicrous, mm. to be honest. Some of the stuff he was coming out with, it was like, through gritted teeth, he said it was a great Leeds performance, then went on and gave 10 reasons why we weren't going to do anything else other than that great mm. performance. And I think he got caught up in the passion of it all. And I think probably him as an individual, the fact that probably he sees that as cheating mm. and it bothered him that much that he thought it was cheating, that 
his, his passionate response to it came mm. out in what was utter nonsensical rubbish, if mm. I'm honest. And, and it were, like, he, he came out, I think one of his famous comments was, uh, Leeds will not do all this season, look at the bench. And we just won. We just battered, <laughs> played Derby off the park. And it yeah. was like, okay, I, I, I see the point he's trying to make, yeah. but he didn't make that point. It yeah, just, yeah. it were kind of like he was just, like he was unloading a little yeah. bit there. But I mean, that, that's from our point of view, that, that's, I, the divisive part of what it is an opinion is obviously this is what we're all saying. Everyone's got different opinions, but I think um, the thing I say with Keith is as well is he has, he's got a, he's got his opinion and he's got a way of saying it. He very rarely kind of sways from it, which I think, especially in football, especially in football punditry and in inverted commas, is uh, and I'm not saying this because he's a comic and he is is a good lad, but it was one of like it, if you t- if you've seen any of his t- when he's t- been talking about the uh, Republic of Ireland, I mean. I'll, I'll give him his shoes. He does not sit on the fence. And yeah. I have been sat with people where you're going, Jesus Christ, give <laughs> us an opinion. Don't just tell mm-hmm. me back what we kind of already know. Yeah. I understand. I mean, uh, and from the point of view of seeing it as, if you see punditry as, as yes, it's got to be informative. Yes, it's got to be well-researched. Yes, it's got to be heartfelt and passionate. Um, but it's but there's, there's a sporting element. Of, well, I suppose pretty much a bit like Twitter. But So there'll be... Leeds fans watching that going, I can't believe he's saying that. Been, everyone that doesn't like Leeds going, yeah, yeah. Keith, you're yeah. absolutely <laughs> right, son. Yeah. Unbelievable. 20 points, get him off him right now. In fact, find all the players individually <laughs> and get Bielsa wherever he needs to go because that's just how kind of football uh, tribalism is and that's why we love it. But No, you're right. You, I think right. hopefully as, as the season moves on, it'll get put into context. I still, I mean, I'm reading when I read the report of it, being two hundred grand, you just still kind of thought, "Jesus, two hundred grand." But then the other side of it is, Leeds go up. I'm not saying yeah. I'm not saying TV money is a bit on end all, but one hundred and fifty million quid in your pocket, then yeah, bothered. I must admit, um, we'll come on to Joe Urquhart anyway because we've got a question for you in a bit. But <laughs> I saw a tweet from Joe last night. I was sat on the set with my lad and my missus, and it was. Uh, Spygate Leeds have been fined two hundred grand. And my initial reaction was yes, get in. I mean, this is like <laughs> this is over. like what are you doing? I was yeah. like, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take yeah. that. No. And then as I sat on it, student for a little bit, mm. I was like, wait a minute, two hundred grand for a man on a public road mm. observing training that's visible from a public road. Mm. And then that's the bit where it starts to niggle a bit. Now my suggestion was we send the exact same intern to EFL headquarters and he throws a penny over the fence roughly every minute until we pay back <laughs> the two hundred thousand in one pences. But I think it shows as well. That's I, I, I suppose a healthy Leeds fan cynicism as well because it's like the minute that flags up on your feed or whatever and says five points, ten points, you're going, oh my god. So when two hundred grand, which is a hell of a lot of money, comes, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Quite sure. Just, I was I was it. Move on. I was like, yeah, brilliant, fantastic. That's that done then. Over and on to the next one. But yeah, um, I think I think I think speak for us all, and I know people at the club as well. I think they're just glad it's over and done with, mm. and that yeah, the fine is heavy-handed. I'm not surprised with the lead cynicism involved. Um, at least now we can concentrate on the remainder of the yeah. season, 14 cup finals essentially. Mm-hmm. But um, moving on ever so slightly, um, we get asked for some fan questions. Yeah. So I banged out on Twitter uh, with the hashtag AskPruts. What I also discovered is somebody else had you on a show and used AskPruts. Uh, and I read one and it was like from 2013. Right. Like, <laughs> what hair product do you use in like 2013? I was like, what the fuck was that? Jesus. From, bro? So uh, here we go. Um, it's always a, a crazy one. Would Prutz rather fight uh, a one Pontus Janssen size Berardi or a hundred Berardi size Pontus Janssen? <laughs> that is bizarrely very good. Um, I'd go for, I think, yeah, I think whatever concentration you get Pontus in would be quite a tough proposition. I'd go for the Berardis, I think. Right, that was from Josh Townsend. Um, I did filter out one that said, what would you prefer on your fingers? What's it residue? And I stopped reading after yeah. that. Um, Before you bought, we've yeah. already talked about Keith Andrew, so I'll not mention what Max Dixon asked. <laughs> um, He's got magnificent hair, by the way. Yeah, hair products. Uh, Salop White, uh, if he can ask, uh, if he can answer this question, ask him about. Uh, we've already talked about that. Uh, Neil Burrows, even before Spygate, fans felt the club was ill-treated by the EFL. Whether it was rubber the green from refs, disciplinary panels, the Pontus Janssen uh, on Sky thing, which is ironic, where he yeah. basically talks about cheating, uh, and then we saw Charlie Austin do very some very similar in the Premier League and not get the same punishment. Yeah, uh, we saw Canos Nut Berardi, uh, sorry uh, Alioski oh, yes. in the uh, dugout. Help him if he'd have tried to nut Berardi. Yeah, it'd have been <laughs> over for him. Uh, you know, and and basically is 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 hinting at the what we've already talked a about. A slight bias yeah. against Slate. Uh, I think 
over the course of the season, I'd have to be honest and say I can't see that. Um, like I said, as there's always injustice around. We've, I've mentioned uh, Kimar's handball against Forest and the look on Michael Dawson's face was absolutely <laughs> incensed, <laughs> incensed. Because to watch it, everyone's going, that's, he's just punched in the net. We, so that's I know that's one instance you give me three or four that I, it all evens itself out, I, I believe. It's funny you say that, and you know, talk about the Leeds bias. My friend's a Forest fan, and yeah. ironically, I had him working with me the day after, and he was absolutely mental about it. And I went, look, Les, it, <laughs> it evens itself out over the course of the season. <laughs> yeah. And I gave him that exact exactly. party line. And then, you, and then you walk away from the, the conversation. Have the like, boot being on the other shoe, I don't exactly. want the blood. Anyway, uh, Joey Morton, uh, which is an interesting one. David Sommer at work today, so I'm guessing he works with David Sommer, told me about when Prutz bought a tray of shots at the Christmas party, went into the toilet and replaced the shots with uh, potentially piss before handing them out to the rest of the players. I'd like to hear that, his that side of the story. Of- Let's be honest, that's a lot of piss. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of piss going on there. I can, I can, it must have been the first one of the night. Yeah, I can categorically say that's not something I'd do. I mean, so. th- there's that kind of what your class is banned to, but Bans. that if I, I'd have trouble not knocking someone out for doing that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, Joey Morton, tell David Summers lying. Tell David Summers is a dirty liar. <laughs> and Joe Urquhart of uh, Yorkshire Evening Post yes. uh, wants, us, wants you to regale the story where a coach nearly knocked out Jermaine Beckford. A coach. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think man, like he got run over. No, <laughs> no. Um, thankfully not. <laughs> it was we were doing some fitness training with Gary Mack, and he brought this fella in who worked somewhere in the Midlands where he, it was it must have been Coventry. So he worked with a um, rugby team around there, big hard fella, uh, and um, so we've come out in the afternoon to do whatever form of whatever it is that we're doing, and. Um, We've all walked up and said hello to him. He's, he's, he's already got the arse with us just for being footballers. Casper's <laughs> walked up and said hello and he's basically just told Casper to sod off, basically. Like, hand outstretched. And like, all oh, right, that type of fella then. And then um, we started doing some round um, Thorpe Arts, like warming up a bit of laps, a few sprints and stuff. And Jermaine's at the back with Trezor, I think, like chun- chuntering away about summer. <laughs> I can it, imagine them two being a bit yeah. of a handful. In oh, trouble. I mean, saying that, I mean, Jonathan Douglas, he he, he wasn't scared of giving his opinion, which was yeah. made, made for some quite funny <laughs> confrontations with managers. Um, and um, so these two are chunting her, her away at the back, and the geezer at the front, I can't remember his name, Skinhead do a really kind of heavy set, and um, he, 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 was, he, was, he was boiling by, like, See the blood <laughs> raising, and then his turn round. It is like sprinted at Jermaine to get him in a headlock and getting down to the. So Jermaine's fought him off. Trezor's steamed him. We've all stood there going. I think David Lucas might have got involved because obviously he was a big fella. Lucas, wasn't he? and just we're all just stood there going, "What on earth has just happened?" I mean, I've seen coaches and and players have standoffs, but I've never seen one like grab on another one. And in the end, and fair play to us all. I think Fraser Richardson was there as well. We we just walks off like we know and there is that there is that element of you want to do the session that's been put on you want to do it properly etc 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 but it was one of those only times where we kind of went we're not having this that's utterly ridiculous <laughs> so we all walked in and um and again he's still bouncing outside boiling and then mac has come down and kind of got the gist of what's going on and he was he was great i said lads i'm so sorry you'll never see him again he was just shell-shocked at this he's just gone after jermaine Beck. i mean we know what Bex is like. He can wind people up, and there's been a few times in games where I wanted to throttle him, but it, it was just utterly, utterly bizarre. But I, I, I suppose Joe didn't tell you about when me and him were chatting on. Um, we did something pod based like this, and it got to the end of the of the podcast. We had like I've done it, chewed his ear off for an hour and a half, and his computer crashed. <laughs> So we then spent 10 minutes staring at each other. And it, like, basically, he was praying that it all came through. Me saying, it's fine, I'll come back, no worries. I'll, I'll, you know what I mean? All that type of stuff. It felt like me and him were the only people in the, the actual <laughs> Yorkshire Post building at the time. And then it kind of, I've never seen a man look so crestfallen. And then as it powered up, it was all there. Yeah, He just made his weekend. <laughs> yes, Joe. And he basically skipped out. I was like, yes. <laughs> and I felt a little little glow as I drove off to work after that. To be honest, I have a similar story. I interviewed the guys from the Legion United Foundation once. Yeah. And we set up in their office and we set up and we're like a good 15 minutes into the conversation. <laughs> I'm looking at my laptop and I'm thinking, oh shit, that's not recording. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, I don't broach the subject. And I was like, shall I just let him carry on and then make up some cock and bull story after that my computer's crashed or something. And I was like, Look, man, we have to stop here. 
I've not recorded the last 15 <laughs> minutes. And obviously it looked like me wanting me head on a stick. <laughs> so like, we literally went back and then the 15 minutes we had recorded went into like a four minute segment <laughs> yeah. where we just skimmed over everything yeah. and carried on. So yeah, I do, uh, I do have definite um, sort of um, sympathy for Joe having though, had yeah. many technical issue. Uh, me and Adam Pope famously had a table collapse midway through a podcast. And another yeah. time a guy came in and started playing darts right outside of where we were recording. Really? Yeah. Well, I presume it was in a so working men's club. When, when, I, when I interviewed you previously for the Trustcast, yes. yeah, we uh, we used to record at working men's club. You was the first one where we moved to Iga Studios. Right. And the reason we did, we were sat in this little room because we got kicked out of our normal room. Yeah. So picture the scene. There's me, Popey at the other side, roughly where you are now, a few guys there. around, Ben's there. And uh, the door opens outside me. In walks a guy with a pint, looked at me, gave me a a very knowing nod walked over to the side pops clicked the light on down. popped his pipe down and just started throwing like 180s <laughs> and I was like looking at him while I'm talking to Pope and I'm thinking he ain't stopping and he just carried on he was like in back and it was like a and then somebody else came in. Oh, all right, John. Good day at work. And I just said to Paul, "Look, mate, I'm really sorry, but we have to cam this." Because it, it's nice and authentic, though. Yeah, it's it definitely. That's a rustic <laughs> charm without a shadow of a doubt. But uh, anyway, so that kind of brings us to an end of fans' question, and I'm going to have to crack on a little bit because we have uh, overrun slightly. Uh, but moving on uh, a little bit, we've got um, our favourite um, segment. Not so much for me lately because. I'm not doing very well. Raggy's predictor. So Raggy's yeah. predictor. So a few pros. This is where we attempt, yeah. and I noticed the word attempt, to predict the upcoming Leeds United game. And yourself gets the guess for Mickey Peeker's guest of the week. Right, okay. So you'll be pleased to know it's currently still in the lead. Yes. So you've got big boots to fill. Uh, we're going to... can ruin that quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> we're going for a double week this week. Uh, what with the QPR game next Tuesday, so we might be recording, so we may as well predict it now. Mm-hmm. Um, just to recap on Swansea, we all went for Leeds victories. Uh, Luke Aylin basically ruined old and young Ben's dreams of getting it bang on by giving away that late penalty. Because it ended 2-1, they'd gone 2-0. <laughs> uh, so no one got 2-1, so we all pick up a point. So scores on the doors are um, Mickey P. Kirk's guest of the week, still in the lead on 35. Young Ben, 32. Myself on 30. Uh, old Ben, 30, uh, 26. And Gaz still bringing up the rear on 25. I'm not behind. I'm only a point now. Point. point. You've been a point well, for a while. Yeah, I know. Marathon, not a sprint. It's not getting very good this <laughs> time. Absolutely. Uh, so we start on Saturday's game. Uh, Leeds Bolton, how do we see it going? Start with you, Prutz. Oh, I, 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 I can only see a Leeds win, if I'm terribly honest. I don't know it's terrible yeah, times for Bolton, but I'm sure... Least fans listening to this don't care. <laughs> Not at the moment, no. Um, so you want a score as well? Score. 2 0. 2 0. Ben? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're getting up off the chair. Uh, 4 0 leads win. 4 0? Yeah. Nil. Wow. And that healthy goal. Leads close some of them goals back after last weekend. Mm. Yeah. True story. I'm going to go 3 0. 3 0. Gary? I'm gonna go two 0 purely because I don't think we've got a four 0 in us, even though I've willed one all season. I'm going three 0 QPR against oh. Leeds next Tuesday away rescheduled. QPR are a weird. One, QPR are yeah. not a bad side to be fair. It just depends. They're, they're which like a QPR Jekyll and Hyde. They're like a Jekyll and Hyde. But they will right. absolutely want to spoil us, so they'll come fired up definitely. Naki West West Brom tonight, well against us. They got West Brom tonight. Yeah. Um. Well, is it, was, is it at, it's, it's at QPR. It's at QPR. Yeah, it's, at QPR. Yeah. it's actually one nil to West Brom, as you mentioned. That. Yeah. So yeah. Could, <laughs> could be um, fatigue could play play a part in this, can it? Um, could. Well, yeah, if they've played Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, and mm-hmm. Wednesday, is it, or Tuesday? Next, next Tuesday. I'll go Leeds to win down there. One two. One two. Nice. Yeah, I think two, f- two nil. How old is old Ben compared to young Ben? <laughs> Quite I'm thirty next month. Yeah, yeah. Don't look it. Thanks. Right. <laughs> young Ben, how old are you? Twenty-one. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Depressing, aren't A one nil. A one nil leads win. One nil leads win. Yeah. Uh, a one nil leads win. One nil. Hard fought one nil. I think. I'm going. One. One three, Naki Wells always scores against us. Shh, <laughs> always. So he's, he'll get one. Yeah. Bolton then Saturday should be a game we should be winning if we're gonna, you know, yeah. want to be up and up and about it. I think 
Obviously, they got a drub in by Norwich at the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, a fair. We won't, we won't get the series. same Bolton as Norwich. No, got. we won't. Definitely not. Um, so, yeah, we can only hope on that one. Everybody going, I should imagine? No. Yep. No. Oh, yeah, it's home, yeah. Yeah, I'm going, yeah. <laughs> Back in the yeah, room. Really yeah. definite there. Yeah. I was there. Somebody's I was like, what? What's happened? I don't know, yeah. Uh, so we'll move on to our final um, segment this week, um, as we've run out of time, if I'm if I'm really honest. And um, we'll go for this. Just find the right button. Uh, orange one. Shit out of the week. The shit out of the week segment, where we uh, <laughs> isolate one individual, or group of individuals, who have uh, shit houses in one way or another. Now, I normally check it in group and go, who should we have shit house of the week? But I've made your decision for you this week, gents, and I'm sure you'll be happy about it. I'm going to go for a collective EFL. <laughs> Shit house of the week. Okay. Happy with that? I can't, I can't argue that. against yeah. that. Happy no. that? No. Happy no. That. Happy no. that. Yeah. Cool, that's that done then. <laughs> uh, we'll try and get the trophy over to you at some point. They still might have it from last time they won it, to be honest. So. They've had it a few times this year. Really. And the time before They'll that, be yeah. They might be getting an trick ball soon, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of it for shit house of the week. I think we'll finish off with you, Prutz, with a couple of final questions. Best player you've ever played with? Got to get the cliche questions in when you're Yeah, no, they're good. Um... I was fortunate to play in an under twenty ones team, which had a hell of a lot of good players. I went on to do really well, and I kind of petered out. So <laughs> it um, Joe Cole was at that age as good as I've seen, and John Terry. To be fair, he was he, the fellow that played for God knows how long for Chelsea was the same lad that pitched up at Forest on loan when he was eighteen and nineteen. Oh. Absolute man mountain, and I mean heading balls off people's feet and all that type of stuff. Biggest character. Um. Or Joker, however you want to. Joker, yeah. However you want to dress it up. It's character seems to be the PC word, it? doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Joker. Um, I mean, someone latterly that I've met who I cross paths with and not necessarily work with, Jimmy Bullard, which <laughs> he does come across a certain way. He's quite obviously very eccentric. Um, but I played with character. Jack Lester was really live when I was at Forest. He was he was good fun. Still a very good friend of mine. Um, so yeah, from that point of view, there's, there's, I've met a lot of silly buggers, but they kind of fall into the mass of silly buggers that you meet. So you, you you touched on it earlier. When does banter transcend into you want to kick his head in? Oh, when if someone Christ brings trays of u- urine out, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would, that, that, that would that quite that obviously. Line, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, there's hopefully several rungs before that. Yeah. Um, Has I, there ever been anyone you've like they've done something and you thought I'm, I'm going to kick your head in? Um. I've always, I mean, you, you you soon learn early on that you've got to take a lot of stuff on the chin yeah. to get... I mean, I've had, like, shoes cut up and trainers drawn and all that type of stuff. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's stuff that, I mean, in a normal environment is just utterly ridiculous. I mean, I've, I've seen worse things than that, which um, are quite unseemly. But that's just... And I think... The, the generation of footballers I grew up with that kind of turned pro at the end of the 90s were coming off the back of it being quite crazy, but also before camera phones and all that type of stuff. So yeah. not saying that it was like like Sodom and Gomorrah at all, but it was it, there was certain elements of people weren't looking to get you to do anything or anything like that at all. So you, we were just left to our own devices. But um, I think that whole, like you say, that whole banter type thing, um, there's, there's a lot of... A lot of light. I, mean, I suppose nowadays everyone's gear is too expensive to cut up, or mm. if you wimbled and set fire to, which I've, you'd kind of <laughs> yeah. see. There was, it was, I, I, I can't, it was, um, I can't remember I was working with the other week. It was Billy Sharp actually talking about, um, Rob Kosluck or Michael Brown. No, Michael Brown gluing Rob Kosluck's shoes to the floor, <laughs> these new kind of like Prada slip ons, standard, which <laughs> he said. Like put his, and this is what box man so he put his feet in. I was like, who, who puts the feet in both shoes unless you are two, and then tries to walk off? You sit down and put them on, don't you? Yeah. Apparently, do like that. Shoved them on, went to walk and promptly fell on the ground. <laughs> and then I like, ripped him up and said, for ages on on the um, on the um, floor of the changing room at Bramall Lane, there was like the bottom end of these pair of shoes <laughs> into the floor, which I thought was really funny. So yeah, uh, so. Things like that, um, yeah. But anything involving Christ bodily fluid, I can very much do without. Yeah, I've I've only got one. When I, when Is I joined, it worse than when that? I, yeah, <laughs> bodily fluid was involved quite a lot. But um, when I joined military, I was like pre-warned. Um, you know, well, military. When, I mean, when, that's when like you get to your unit, football or you, steroids, you can it? get ready, kind of thing. And I remember like, I hid in my room, door locked for days, like don't come out. 
And I came out and I got to stop at stairs. There was two very drunk lads stood there with an MFO box, which is essentially a massive cardboard box. And he went, Ray, get in there. I went, what? He went, get in. If you roll a seven, you can get out. There weren't even a seven on it. <laughs> Four flights of stairs, Jesus. right? And when I got out of the bottom, I had to carry it back to the top and they were having bets how many flights I could take before I got out. My God. Yeah, well, standard. I mean, it standard. It's, it's, well, I mean, it was, um, and I think things have changed quite drastically for the better because I was a YT at Forest. So, I mean, you weren't kind of averse to being ordered to run around the track at Forest with either in just your slips or, I mean... And, People just throwing stuff at you. <laughs> Which, like you say, I mean, you, you say it now, and there's, I, I understand absolutely the sensitivity that comes with other people's experiences completely. But it was just seen as when you were a younger kid. It was again, it was like it was like stress testing, and it wasn't. I mean, some of it you probably class as bullying, but that's it was just the kind of way of the world. And you look, there is a certain I say fondness. I mean, Christ running around with people throwing stuff at you when you had to go into a bit bizarre, but. <laughs> um, it, it was it was just you know what I mean character building yeah, there lo- a lot of fellas chucked together and not fellas like idiots aren't we yeah exactly <laughs> almighty definitely let me well let me ask you first before you before we go into anything else I'll wrap it up I mean from a Leeds point of view don't worry, I'm not going to ask him whether you've been chased around a football pitch by <laughs> someone no clothes on but sat here right Too now in February do you think by May that Leeds will be going absolutely bonkers and this place will be a party town because of one thing? I've been cautiously optimistic this season, <laughs> to be honest. It, it's the biggest chance we'll ever get, I think. And it just seems that this year we'll, we'll do it. We'll get over the line. I, I'm more confident in this group of players that will just play to the final whistle in every game, keep fighting. And, and the man in charge has just got them all organised. So I think we'll do it, yeah. I'm absolutely terrified before every game for partly what Raggy said, just with that, cl- it feels like we're that close. Although mm. it's still quite, you know, 14, 14 cup finals, if you it. like. Mm-hmm. But this feels like even, we talked about it with the Gary Monk era when we looked nailed on foot playoffs and then slipped away. But this feels like looking at our running, looking at Norwich's running, looking at other teams around us running, it feels like the best opportunity we're probably going to get in the last, as long as we've been out of the Premier League. Mm. But still, every match day is not longer a pleasant experience, I'll be honest. It, I have to lace myself with ale pretty much every game just to get through it. Ooh, <laughs> no, like you said, it's uh, it's almost like a scary experience every Saturday now. It's that anxiety that builds and it's almost a relief come half past five when game's finished or misery if we lose. Um, but yeah, I think we'll go up. I think we'll go up automatically. And I th- if we don't, I do truthfully think we'd struggle in, in playoffs. That's that's my problem. I think we'd struggle. I can't. I can't sum up playoffs. I can't. I cannot do it. Don't do playoffs. I don't want playoffs. No. Um, I'm a bit. The last few weeks, and we've not sort of carried on the same sort of form. We've I think we've lost too many over the last couple of weeks. If we can play again like we did against Swansea, Derby, and and sort of do that more mm. consistently, then we're, we're pretty much up. But uh, it's just getting back to that mm. level, which I don't think we've quite got back to yet. I will take some under 12 who comes in for whoever's injured. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm balling the ball in the net every game for the next 14 games to get us a point, uh, three points. So I don't give two It's tosses. funny that, it's 14 games. And, and I bet between now, between the end of the, between the start of the season and now, I bet that's flown by. And then you yeah. you just think the next few months is yeah. just going to be torture. What, what about you, I'm not, I'm not I'm not taking like a, a sick pleasure in it, but I just think <laughs> the, the way it's flown by and then like you said, the reason you go there early season you're suddenly going, this is amazing, this is amazing and then you, I bet you're skipping along to Ellen Road Saturday afternoon, this is going to be great. What? The tipping point was suddenly, shit, we're top of the league. Yeah. We've been top of the league for quite a long time now. What's it like as a player? Um, in those situations? I think, the, the only thing, I mean, the times when I've been in a fortunate enough position to be at that end of the table, I mean, the Leeds uh, season when we got to the playoff final, uh, Chef Wednesday when we finished second and comfortably finished second after the, th- the thing that tipped it for us when we'd beaten um, Chef United and then there was all sorts of Chef United stuff going on off the pitch which affected them in quite a big way and quite rightly so. And then we kind of meandered towards then. And then when I was at Forest when I was younger and you kn- you didn't feel it because there was no weight of expectation because you were just a young kid flying around. Um, and like I said, that kind of it felt like the space in between games went really slowly. Like when I think about being a Wednesday, and, but then 
the games went by quite quickly, but you couldn't get away from it. And and the other side of it being at Wednesday when we were fighting to stay in the championship and we eventually did on the last day of the season. And it was one of the, the one of the only games I can remember where things went absolutely perfectly. We pumped Borough, we were tuning up after about half an hour and I felt like this was one of the most straightforward games of football I've ever played in. Um but it seemed like an interminable amount of time between January, February when it's all cold to that glorious day when mm. it's boiling hot, fans are in the shirt sleeves and you kind of all know collectively that it's going to happen. Mm. But I mean, fighting to get into the Premier League, I, I think it's it's phenomenal what's, what they've done so far. The, the, the pessimist in, in, in you goes, you don't want it to be one of those seasons that fans remember forever. Like our season where we got to the play final but didn't go up and it is still fondly remembered but there is that fundamental of, well, I don't know, maybe what does last longer, that feeling or the actual realisation that you've actually done something that stands the test of time. Whereas mm. if this team does it, if this squad does it with that manager... And everything that's sort of gone on, the injuries... I just think it'll be a phenomenal... One of, one yeah. of the... one of the I would say one of the greatest because there's been some fucking amazing times at this football yeah. club. But one of the bigger ones of, of, in recent history. And for a generation of kids that are teenagers, yeah. they'll mm. go, Jesus Christ, we were there when... A loco came over and we smashed that wave to the Premier League. Yeah. So do you think they'll do it, Prince? I think from what I've seen, when they're at their absolute best, yeah, I think they're going to get pushed. I think they'll all push each other. I think what Norwich are doing is phenomenal with the players that they've got. Um, what Sheffield United are doing as well, I yeah, think, yeah. when they're <clears> on song. But there is always that looming shadow of, of what a Borough and what a, what a West Brom are. Yeah, mm. West Brom's the one that sort of worries me, just because of the players they've got. And and the way they sort of beat us earlier in the season, mm. um, that was a proper off day, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. that's you not. And I think I suppose the good thing is from least probably not many times you can say that over the course no, of the season no. when you've had. Well, there's not been many teams, even if we've lost at times, that have outclassed us. Mm. I think maybe West Brom, Norwich, Norwich. Yeah. I don't think that mm. the Norwich game is a weird I, I, I one. The Norwich, Norwich game was a weird Norwich one. Norwich just seemed to really get away from. Obviously, early goals never help, yeah. but it. Just seem to drift away from yeah. Leeds doing anything in it. Yeah, I agree. And with I think what what the, I mean to to get up in a season such as this, you need to have things need to align. Yes, you need to work out as we said off the pitch. You need to, need to have good players. But would you have said? Would you have a with a great respect known Timu Puki and B had him right now as the top goal scorer? Mm. You'd have gone. Sorry, well, I, I don't see that at all. Came out of we sat here in the summer and we and. Think, there was somewhat about a, a Reading seven Reading. million moved to Reading. Million, and about your thinking, but yeah, yeah, on then. yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I said we, I'd yeah. drive him there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I think he, he fell into the similar brackets, Calvin Phillips, mm. where he'd been around a little bit, not really done it. We didn't really know where he fit in, and if we needed to make money to buy other players, then we were open to that. But again, that's why Marcello Bielsa earns the money he earns, and he's a Leeds yeah. manager, and we're not. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, simple as that. <laughs> so uh, that kind of brings us to an end of episode forty-six. A massive thanks to Prutz for coming down. My pleasure. Uh, absolute Anytime, class. Man. It's been brilliant. Um, cheers time. to everybody who gets involved. Please retweet, like, share. Uh, we are endeavouring to get back live, but um, if we're honest, we're a bit of a homeless podcast at the moment. So we are travelling around a little bit uh, in any spot we can possibly get in. So a big thanks to get your media who've let us come down and record today, and a big thanks for Prutz for coming down. So uh, that's it. So on to uh, six points in the next two games. I'll see you there. See you there.